Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Moran. I'm the founder and president of Concierge Diamonds. We're here in my office in Los Angeles, California, in downtown LA. And as promised, this is our scheduled webinar where we'll talk a little bit about the basics of diamonds and what to look for when you're buying one. And then I'll be answering questions uh, from all of you guys out there on the internet. So we're going to give it about three minutes as people are still uh, logging in and joining us. So in the meanwhile, uh, I'll just kind of talk you through a little bit about who I am and my background as we're waiting for people to show up. Um, so again, my name is Dan Moran. I started Concierge Diamonds around nine and a half years ago, it'll be 10 years in July. And uh, prior to that, I've been, I've been in the diamond business for almost 20 years now in total. Uh, my family has been in the business uh, since the middle of last century, so it's been a long time. I'm either third or fourth generation, depending on how you count, uh, with uncles and stuff. And our business was founded on the philosophy that rather than me buying stones and making rings and sticking them in a safe and then having clients walk in and say to me, hey, what do you have for sale today? What can I buy from you? What we do instead is we speak with our clients, we learn what their wants and needs are, and then we curate a selection of diamonds specifically for each client. We talk them through the virtues and benefits of each given diamond, you know, compare them, contrast, and then let clients choose what they want after which we custom make a ring for each client. So each ring is made for that client uh, as we go. There's nothing pre-existing, everything's made uh, custom. So that's who we are. And uh, again, in about two minutes, we'll kind of uh, uh, start the, the, the proceedings formally. But in the meanwhile, uh, thanks for anybody who is here and we'll wait for a few more people to, uh, to join us. What I'd like to do is to uh, talk you through kind of who we are as a team. I'll, I'll, in a minute, I'll take a walk around and I'll show you guys kind of where we do what we do and how. Then we'll talk about diamond theory a little bit and then I'll open the floor up for questions. Uh, do we have enough people on yet or should I give it another minute? All right, looks like we've got a pretty good number of people here online. So let me, uh, let me show you guys concierge diamonds. So this is my office. Uh, we're here in downtown LA. You want to point the camera out the window for a second so they can see where we are? Um, we're in downtown Los Angeles, and we're here because this is kind of where the industry lives. In our building, uh, this is a 16th floor building, and every single office is something to do with jewelry. So whether it's diamonds, whether it's gold, whether it's platinum, whether it's precious stones, or whether it's watches, or you know, uh, bench jewelers, manufacturers, casting houses, setting houses, finishing houses, they're all here. All the big shipping houses are here. Gem Labs have offices in this building. So it's very, very convenient for us to have access to the whole market without having to go very far. Um, when I was first starting the company, I, w I wished that I could have had my office at the beach. That was always my dream. But this is where it is. If I built my office at the beach, I'd be coming downtown 10 times a day anyway. It just didn't make any sense. So here we are. Uh, this is my room. Let's, uh, let's take a walk. This is one of our viewing rooms where uh, my teammates will, and I will sit with clients as we're going over stones with them. This is our conference room, another place where we like to meet with people and, and uh, when there's larger groups, this is where we, we see them. Um, and here's our sales team. Uh, guys, this is Kendall and Caroline. Hi, nice um, to meet you all. Uh, this is where Angelica sits, but you can't see her because behind the camera right now. Um, Astrid uh, on our sales team is out today, and unfortunately our photographer, uh, Richie, is out today as well. This is our photography setup. As you can see, it's kind of a fancy schmancy camera box. Diamonds go in here, and then this platform holds them steady, and it's got controlled lighting so we can show them under uh, consistent conditions for, uh, for for clients. And again, we have a camera here to take side angles and a camera here for top angles and then it's all processed on this machine and that's what Richie spends all day long doing. Um, so out here is our production space. Guys, say hi. This is, uh, this is Rachel who runs our client support team. Madison is in charge of production of new pieces and Jess who works kind of a little bit on both. Uh, this is where we, we don't actually do the manufacturing in this office because the noise and the fumes and all that stuff is too much. So. That's all in other spaces uh, in this building and across the street. But these guys manage all of that from here. Um, 
In here, you've got Aubrey. That's Aubrey. Um, many of you, if you've worked with us, already know Aubrey. Aubrey is my external brain. Um, Aubrey is our sourcing manager, so as we're looking for, for stones for new clients, it's oftentimes going to be Aubrey who's out there talking with the, our trusted uh, supply chain and vendors and identifying stones for clients, bringing them in. You can see all these envelopes on Aubrey's desk. Each one of these is a selection of diamonds for a client, and so Aubrey spends an awful lot of time checking and then rechecking them, and then when, when Aubrey's happy with them, then I start taking a look, or Caroline or Kendall or whoever's working with that client starts to take a look and narrow down just to pick the best ones for each client. So every stone that we show has been examined by several people on our team before we ever show it to a client, because I wouldn't show a client a stone if I can't vouch for it. And then, last but not least, uh, this is Isabel. It says our, is our bookkeeper and controller. Uh, Marie, who works on her team, is also unfortunately not here today, but this is where we deal with the, the money. So when, when it's time for clients to pay us, uh, Issa's in charge of that. When it's time for us to pay our vendors, Issa's in charge of that. And of course, also making sure that Uncle Sam doesn't get mad at us and we're doing all the things we need to do and doing it correctly. It's a tremendous amount of work and I'm lucky to have somebody whose job it is because I don't know how to do it. Um, so very briefly, that's our office, that's our team. Uh, unfortunately, a few people aren't here today, but it gives you the idea. Uh, why don't we go in the conference room and we'll talk about diamonds a little bit. And uh, if you guys, whenever you get a chance, come on in, okay? <coughs> So, let's talk in very brief and general terms about diamonds. I know a lot of you are here and attending today, and while well, I fix my chair, pardon me, and attending today because you are considering, contemplating uh, some kind of diamond purchase. And so, what I thought I would do is equip you with the tools that you need as you're out shopping for a diamond so that you can identify and evaluate whether a diamond is right for you. Now, I recognize this isn't relevant to everyone, but I'm going to frame this as though we're shopping for an engagement ring because many of our clients, that's exactly what they're doing. And the principles are the same whether you're shopping for a ring or for earrings or for whatever. But, so when I say ring, please use the general case. I'm just used to talking about engagement rings because we do an awful lot of that. I'm going to close the door because when the phones start ringing, it's going to get obnoxious. All right. So how to buy a diamond. Um, I'm sure that many of you guys have heard the phrase, the four C's of diamonds, and I wanna talk you through my perspective on them. Now, the four C's are the primary characteristics that govern a diamond's value. They're the primary drivers of the price of a diamond. Now, they're not the only drivers, but they're kind of the most significant and the most easily digestible, so they're a very good place to start. They are carat weight, color, clarity, and cut. Let me try to spend one minute or less on each one, and then as you guys have questions, we can deep dive wherever we need to. So, let's start with carat weight. Carat weight's very simple. You put a diamond on a scale, how much does it weigh? A carat is just one-fifth of a gram. There's nothing magical about carats. They're just a convenient unit that we use to talk about diamonds because talking about them in milligrams sounds strange. All you really need to know about carat weight is the more a diamond weighs, the larger it will be, and the more expensive it will be. And unfortunately, the relationship between weight and price is not linear, it's exponential. So increasing the weight a little bit will increase the price a lot. So you have to be careful where the numbers get a little ugly. Clarity. Well, let's talk about color first, actually. Color is, is a, a very, very important characteristic of diamonds because many, many people, when they see a diamond and say, wow, that's really bright, they're talking about color a lot. So a diamond's a product of nature. It's a crystal that's made out of carbon. Those crystals typically formed between one and three billion years ago, very deep underground at high pressure and high temperature that forces the carbon into a superheated liquid state. But as it rises to the surface, cools down and solidifies, a diamond becomes essentially impenetrable. Nothing can ever get inside of a diamond and change it. I'm sure you've all seen those old TV commercials where they say a diamond is forever. Well, that's what they mean. Right? The way a stone looks today, it will look exactly the same 50,000 years from now. Diamonds don't change. This is not true, by the way, for other precious stones. If you take a ruby or a sapphire and heat it up, you can change the color of the stone permanently. But that doesn't happen to diamonds. Diamonds are fixed. However, a billion years ago, when the crystal was still forming, sometimes there are other chemicals present in the ground there along with the liquid carbon. Maybe some nitrogen, maybe some iron or cobalt or boron or whatever happened to be there. 
And sometimes those other chemicals mix into that liquid crystal and give the resulting stone an overtone of color. Think of it like a splash of orange juice in your vodka, right? The more OJ you add, the more color. Um, so we grade that color on a scale of D as in Delta down to Z as in Zulu, with D being absolute pure, no color whatsoever. And the farther we go down the alphabet, the more you might start to see a little bit of yellowish or greenish or grayish or brownish creeping into the stone. So our goal has to be to find a diamond that's white enough that it looks white to you. That is all that matters. It does not matter what I think or what Caroline or Kendall think. It doesn't matter what a gem lab thinks. It doesn't matter what your best friend thinks. It's you and the person you're giving it to. You guys get the only votes. If you think it's white, it's white. If you think it's not, it's not. Simple as that. But financially, what I want you to bear in mind about color, and this is not a perfect rule, but it's a good rule of thumb. If you hold everything else about a stone constant, one color grade costs about 15% in money. So to go from J color to I color, 15%, I to H, 15%. This means that a three color grade increase can be a 50% increase in price. So be careful, or again, budgets run away from us. And this is why not everybody buys a D color. Um, so that's color. Clarity. So again, a diamond's a product of nature. When that crystal forms, it never forms perfectly. There are always flaws or imperfections in the crystal. The industry term that you've probably read online is inclusions. We say inclusions because the marketing department doesn't like us to say flaws. It means the same thing. Um, and every diamond has them. Every diamond has inclusions. Even the ones with super high clarity grades have inclusions. They're just not as big. Now to my way of thinking, clarity is actually the least important of the four C's. I'll say that again, the least important of the four C's. As long as we meet one condition, the diamond has to be clean enough that when you look at it with your naked eye at the end of your arm, the way your loved one is gonna be looking at it every day, do you see anything and is it bothering you? If there's a big black dot in the middle of the stone, that's not going to go away because again, diamonds don't change. So you can't buy it hoping that will fade with time. It doesn't work like that. If you see it and it bothers you now, it's always gonna bother you. But once the diamond is clean enough that nothing is bothering your naked eye, you don't get any extra value for going cleaner than that. It doesn't sparkle more or perform better by being gemologically flawless. So I encourage you to treat clarity like a high jump bar. I don't know how sensitive your eyes are. So when we work with clients, we show a pretty wide spectrum of clarity grades to see how dirty it is before that dirtiness starts to bother you. So once we set your high jump bar based on how sensitive your eyes are, anything that doesn't get over that bar, it's disqualified, you can't use it. But once we're over the bar, I really don't care if we're over by this much or this much, but your wallet will care. This is really expensive. Don't pay for that. Now our fourth C is cut. Cut is both really simple and really complicated. So this one takes a second. The simple aspect of cut is, well, what shape do we want? Do we want round? Do we want square? Do we want oval? That's an aesthetic decision. That's one for you and your partner to make. And there's no right or wrong answer there. You like what you like. But the complicated aspect of cut, for each shape, it is very well understood what the correct way is to cut it. So the ratio of length to width to depth is defined. The size of the table, which is that big facet on top, compared to the diameter is defined. The angles where all the facets meet each other, very precisely defined. Everything about the stone is defined, what's correct and what's incorrect. And we can measure that down to very, very high levels of specificity with lasers and other tools. So we can know for sure whether a diamond is cut correctly or not. Now, as I say that out loud, I always ask myself the same two questions. First question, why do we care? Why are we interested in all these ratios and angles and math? At the end of the day, it's a shiny rock. Like, why are we obsessing about this stuff? And the answer is, a diamond's only valuable in the first place because it's beautiful. It's beautiful because it sparkles. And it sparkles because it's a prism. Diamonds bend light, they refract light really, really powerfully. And all this math is designed to optimize how well they do that. So in simplest terms, the better a diamond is cut, the more it will sparkle. That's why we care. Now, the second question I always ask myself, which I actually think is a more interesting question, if we know what the perfect cut is because we did the math and we have the tools to measure it and we all agree it's important, why are we not getting this right every time? Like, why is this even a thing? Why isn't there some giant machine someplace that just stamps out every diamond perfectly cut? You would think we could do that. Well, the problem is that a diamond's a product of nature. 
and the cutter has to work with whatever they dug up that day. So if you're a diamond cutter, you're staring at this funky rock going, how do I cut this to get the best cut that I can, but also the most carat weight that I can, because carat weight's worth money. And typically, cutters solve this optimization problem by optimizing for weight. Why? Because everybody who walks into Zales knows what one carat means, but not everybody knows or understands how to evaluate cut. So cutters cut for what the market wants. They cut for diamonds that are as heavy as possible, as opposed to being as pretty as possible. And those not so great cut diamonds will be less expensive because you've got to preserve more raw material making them. They can be 20 or 30% less expensive than a really well cut stone. But they don't sparkle like they're supposed to. They wind up looking like glass. So my belief is, if you're gonna buy a diamond that looks like glass, spend 10 bucks and buy glass. Don't waste your money on a diamond that doesn't sparkle like a diamond. So here at Concierge Diamonds, we don't work with those not so great cuts. We don't own them, we don't stock them, we don't sell them, it's just not what we do. But I want you to know that they're out there so that as you're out there shopping and you're going, walking through retail stores, and you see a ring in the showcase and you're thinking, gosh, that price is really, really cheap. Your first thought should be, there's probably something wrong with the cut. So there you have it, the four C's of diamonds in a nutshell, carat weight, color, clarity, and cut. Um, that's, those are what I want you to keep in mind as you're evaluating stones and shopping for something for something special in your life. I hope you find those, those kind of uh, variables helpful to consider. Uh, at this point, I'll take a breath. I'll see if anybody has any questions and and uh, I'm happy to help you guys with whatever you need. Yeah, so we had this question from Tyler. Um, what do you wish you knew before you got your engagement ring? Okay, so Tyler, you asked, um, what's something I wish I knew before getting my engagement ring? Um, I'll talk about my experience, then maybe I'll let Caroline talk about hers for a minute <laughs> since, uh, since she's got one. Kendall's not there yet, but you know, one of these days. Um, so my experience. Um, well, mine is a little bit unusual because by the time I purchased my engagement ring for my wife, I've now been married for almost 13 years. But when I bought that ring, I was already in the diamond business and I was much more knowledgeable than a typical consumer, which of course just made me that much more dangerous. So what I decided to do is, my, my wife was and remains very color sensitive, so I knew that I had to get something in a, in a high color. And wasn't terribly fussed about clarity because she, she understood what I had been telling her at the dinner table for all these years, which is that as long as it's clean to the eye, not that important. Uh, but you know, wanted a sizable stone. So what I did at the time is I went for something pretty high in color. I went for something relatively modest in clarity, something well cut because as we've talked about, that really matters. And then given my budget, I just maximized the size. So stuck with a white stone, didn't worry too much about the clarity, maximize the size for the money. That was my thinking. And I wasn't 100% sure when I was buying the diamond what kind of ring design she would like. So what I wound up doing, which is something that a lot of our clients actually do, is I put that diamond uh, that I had chosen for her in a very basic, inexpensive, solitaire setting so that I could get down on one knee and propose and say, this is your diamond, but this ring is temporary. You look around, shop online, look in magazines, see what designs you like. You can wear this around for as long as you need to make a decision, whether that's a few weeks or a few months or however long you take. And then when you're ready, we'll custom make the ring that you really want. And that's what wound up happening. A few months later, we melted down that simple solitaire setting, got the money back out of it, because at the end of the day, gold is gold, and made her the custom ring she really wanted. I would say about, what, 30, 25 or 30% of our clients do that uh, even now. Does that sound right to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so, so that was my experience. Caroline, you want to talk about yours briefly? Mine almost mirrors yours in a way, in the sense that when it came to the time that we were discussing engagement rings, um, it became very clear that there were a lot of stats and numbers and letters and all of these things that I felt like I didn't have a firm grasp on. Um, and I didn't know if someone was telling me like, oh, this is 47% this and it's, it's letter is this and it's good. And I wouldn't have any way to verify what they were saying, like whether it was good for them because that's the stone that they had and that's what they wanted to sell me or if it was good for me because they were acting in my best interest. So I took a deep, deep dive into learning about all of the letters and percentages and stats to figure it out for myself. Um, and through that, I learned that I was exceptionally color sensitive. 
So I knew that ultimately the stone that I was going to get from my now husband is going to have to be high in color. What I wish I knew then was I wasn't going to be as clarity sensitive as I thought. So I ended up going a little bit higher in clarity than I probably could have and should have just because it was almost like paying for a security blanket. Um, you have a different advantage when you're working with a jeweler who can assemble a curation of stones for you and show them to you with specifics. Like it's not that all SI2s are not eye clean and it's not that all VS2s are eye clean. So you get to talk about those stones in particular and really see what they're talking about. Can you see the inclusions? Do you notice the color? Do you see a size difference in between these stones? Do you care more about carat weight, how heavy it is, or do you care about how much finger coverage you're getting? So there were a lot of things that kind of came into play that really where we would have gotten a big advantage from would be working with um, somebody who would assemble a curation for us. Um, I ended up finding my way into the industry because of that and that's something that I pass on to my clients because I know how it feels when you're looking at these numbers and letters and you're saying, I don't, I don't know what any of this is. So me, Kendall, and a handful of other uh, people on the team went to GIA and studied all the specs and stacks, uh, stacks just for you to figure it out um, so you don't have to worry about it. And that's, that's what I wish I knew. All right. Um... Okay, uh, someone is asking, what do I have to know before I look into antique diamond cuts? Ideally with a round shape, thank you. Um, uh, sorry about the squeaky door there. What do I need to know before I look into antique diamond shapes? Um, there's some stuff that you probably should know. Uh, first and foremost, a lot of the rules of cut go out the window with the antique shapes. Those were not cut to optimize performance. They were cut to create a certain look. So it's not so much a math and precision-based approach as it is an artistic approach, in part because the math just wasn't available when these cuts were invented, but in part because they were looking for a specific effect. So cut guidelines kind of fall by the wayside when it comes to the antique cuts, and I'm talking about here old European cuts, old minor cuts, transitional cuts, circular brilliance, and a few others. Um, it's really more about the look and feel of the stone and, and, and what speaks to you. Uh, Kendall, you've worked with a lot of antique cuts. Anything you want to add? Um, I would say if you're shopping for an antique, just to keep it simple. Um, to me, most importantly, is that every antique would be different from one another. So I think this is something that you would not want to focus online for. And you want to make sure that you either are getting your eyes on each antique stone just because they are so different from one another, or have someone that you trust getting their eyes on it. Um, they're all beautiful. That's one of my favorite shapes, but they're definitely harder to find. So it's super important just to go in knowing that there's less rules and focus more, you know, simplify it. Do you like it? Do you like the way that stone looks? Yes or no. Um, that'd be my main advice. Simplify antiques. Okay. Uh, next question. What, uh, uh, what makes custom jewelry superior to what I can find in a retail store? Uh, well, a few things. One, obviously, it's custom. You're getting exactly what you want, exactly the way you want it. In other words, the exact design that you want, made in the metal type that suits you best, exactly in your finger size, made for you. That's a great advantage. Secondly, whatever accent diamonds are on your ring will be chosen to match your center stone. So they'll all be the same color, have the same look, have the same overall effect. Third, Many people assume that when they hear the word custom, they equate it to more expensive. Turns out that's often not the case. It can be the same or less expensive to get a custom-made ring versus buying one that's pre-existing. Why? Because those pre-existing rings were made who knows when, they've been sitting in a showcase for who knows how long, and there's a carrying cost to that for, for the retail jeweler. What I mean by that is, Let's say you walk into a jewelry store and there's 500 rings sitting in the showcase. Now, never mind the center diamonds, just the settings, right? Each one of those settings costs, let's say, $2,000. That means there's a million dollars worth of inventory sitting in that showcase. Well, where'd they get the million dollars? Presumably, they borrowed it from a bank. So they're paying interest on that million dollars and they have to carry that cost, right? So every month that ring sits in the showcase and doesn't sell, now it costs the jeweler more because he's had to pay 
interest on it. Well, who winds up paying that cost? You do, the consumer. You have to pay the jeweler's overhead, which includes all that carrying cost. Our approach in contrast is to make each ring just in time when it's ordered, and there's no carrying cost. The day the ring is done, it's out the door, out into the world to you guys. I don't have a carrying cost, so my costs are lower in the first place, which means your costs are lower. The other big advantage buying an engagement ring for somebody like us over a retail store is retail stores by their nature are generalists, right? They need to know a little bit about everything because they don't know what you're gonna come in for that day. Do you want a diamond ring? Do you want a pearl necklace? Do you want a Rolex? Do you want some silver? They have to know a little bit about everything. We, in contrast, are specialists. If you walk into my office and ask to see my selection of rubies, I don't have anything to show you because that's not what I do, right? Um, don't get me wrong. When clients are looking for precious stones or watches or what have you, we have great connections in the industry and we can help you with that stuff, but it's not our expertise. It's not our inventory, right? Our expertise and specialty is diamonds. So we will have more and know more when it comes to diamonds than any retail store could ever hope to by their nature. You guys, anything you want to add on that? I think that uh, it is really important when you are looking that if you don't understand or know what you're looking for, you should trust and know your jeweler because they will act in your best interest to, to make sure that you're getting the best piece possible, whether it is a colored gem or a salt and pepper diamond or a, a diamond that is antique or not antique. Um, or something custom cut, we've done all of those. Uh, you really gotta know that and, and trust who you're working with and that's kind of like a major pro, I would say. Mm. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, this is kind of a twofer here. Uh, what percentage of diamonds choose, choose marquees and can you speak to HCA? So I'll answer one, I'll let you guys answer the other. Um, what percentage of diamonds choose marquees Nationally, I can tell you, fewer than 1% of engagement rings feature Marquis diamonds. Here, our numbers are probably a little higher than that, but it's not more than 2 or 3%. Um, part of the reason we do more than average is I happen to really love Marquis. Um, I've made Marquis pieces for my wife, for my mother, for my sister. I think they're awesome. I think they can look really big and impressive, with, even with a relatively small stone. Um, but nationally, they're just not that popular, so they can be, they can be hard to find, especially well-cut ones. Um, I'm happy to talk about HCA, but I know you guys talk about this stuff a lot too. You guys wanna, Caroline, please, give us your two cents on HCA and then I'll jump back in. Sure, so when we're talking about HCA scores or any um, type of metric that you find online, you'll, you'll Google anything and you'll find like, ideal specs are in this super specific range. What you're thinking about and what you're working with is really an abstraction of an abstraction. So this is somebody who doesn't have the capability to be able to examine that diamond in person. So they create these arbitrary, well seemingly arbitrary and kind of nonsensical um, ways to measure these stones. And that is to guarantee sparkle. Now the best way to guarantee sparkle is by working with a jeweler who can assess these diamonds in person. Because you might not notice that this diamond is 15% less sparkly than it's supposed to be, but we do because that's what we do all day, every day. So with an HCA score, that's not something that any jeweler in the industry will ever use. That's not something that any diamond grading lab is using um, and it doesn't hold any weight. So it's kind of just something arbitrary to give the consumer um, a little bit of confidence. And uh, I would think that you need to put your confidence in a different place. <laughs> Um, I want to go back to marquee really quick. I think marquees are super understated. Um, they're a great shape if you want something elongated, and I also think they look really cool flipped east-west. On top of that, they're super popular, at least recently, making um, settings with like marquees down the side or using them, maybe not for the center stone, but in like wedding bands or accents. So I think if you're considering marquee, go for it. They're a really fun shape, and they're super unique. You don't see them as much. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with that. I think marquees and pear shapes both are gonna be having a moment next year. So making a prediction right now, remember I said it. Um, all right, <coughs> excuse me, next question. Uh, I'm looking into diamonds, what's the difference between man-made and natural? Okay, buckle up, this is a short question with a long answer. So here we go. Um, on a superficial level, there's virtually no difference between a 
man-made, sometimes called synthetic, sometimes called lab-grown diamonds, and a natural one. They can look to the naked eye virtually identical. Now, on a microscopic level, they look different, and various gem labs and, and even to the consumer, there are tools available that you can, in 10 seconds or less, know whether a diamond is natural or synthetic. So that's a solved problem. Um, but I think the question that really you were getting at here was, well, which one should I get? Right? Should I buy a lab grown or should I buy a natural? And that's a tougher question because one key difference, really the biggest key difference I think between lab grown and natural is that one of them retains value and the other does not. Now, there's been a lot said, I'm gonna come back to this retain value thing because it's the bulk of what I wanna say, but there's been a lot said about, well, lab, -made, uh, lab grown diamonds are more ethical or they're more eco-friendly. Um, that's just a claim that the lab-grown diamond industry has made. It turns out it's, it's really not as simple as that. It's much more debatable which one is more eco-friendly because the energy requirements for making lab-grown diamonds are enormous. So you're burning an awful lot of fossil fuels to make lab-grown diamonds. But then again, diamond mining, clearly digging giant holes in the ground, uh, has significant environmental impacts. So there's some degree of debate about which one is greener and I encourage you to do your own research on that. The ethical question is a little bit more complicated. Um, unfortunately, the diamond industry has a fraught history when it comes to ethics, to say the least. You know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, there was a tremendous issue with so-called blood diamonds or conflict diamonds, which was a scenario that happened uh, where essentially uh, war profiteers in Africa were trading diamonds to fund really horrific uh, you know, internal conflicts in Africa, as well as awful child slave labor, just aw just really horrifying things that happened because these bad actors realized that they could pull these shiny rocks out of the ground and sell them for a lot of money and use it to buy guns, to put it as simple as that. Now, it's estimated that in the 70s and 80s, as much as 15% of diamonds coming into the US were, were blood diamonds. The good news is today, not really an issue that number is significantly less than 1%. I don't wanna say zero because I couldn't swear that it's literally not one, but it is vanishingly small. It's just not a thing anymore. And there are two reasons for that. The first is the Kimberly process, which is this voluntary but universally followed process in the diamond industry um, that was designed to track the origin of diamonds to make it more difficult for these guys to mix their blood diamonds in with conflict-free diamonds, uh, made it more difficult for bad actors to, to put diamonds into the market. So the, the costs of doing it became less attractive. Uh, another reason why blood diamonds aren't really a thing is because of the rise of lab-grown diamonds. If you're an unscrupulous, dishonest jewelry store today, it's easier and cheaper for you to buy a lab-grown and try to pass it off as a natural than it is for you to buy a blood diamond and try to pass it off as ethical. So you'll have an easier time and make more money doing a different kind of fraud if you're a jeweler today. So there's no incentive for jewelers to be looking for blood diamonds. Um, so between those two factors, blood diamonds aren't really a thing. On the contrary, um, the world of natural diamonds has made huge strides towards responsible business practices and giving back uh, to the communities where diamonds are mined. Um, I would encourage you guys to look up diamond mining in Botswana right now. They're an amazing case study and how to do it right. Botswana nationalized their diamond trade a while ago. So the government owns the diamond mines and all of the profits from diamond mining in Botswana have gone to build infrastructure, roads and schools and hospitals, um, because that's their, that nation's single greatest natural resource is diamonds. So in a very real way today, if you buy a diamond from Botswana, you are helping that country pull itself out of poverty. And in fact, they have one of the highest standards of living in that region because of their diamond mining. Whereas if you buy a lab-grown diamond, who are you helping? Um, you know, the movie Blood Diamond is what started this into the public consciousness, right? Leo DiCaprio did a great job convincing us that natural diamonds are evil. Did you guys know Leo DiCaprio owns a lab-grown diamond company? He has skin in the game. So you gotta wonder where his perspective is coming from. Not that there's anything wrong necessarily with doing that. It's a beautiful piece of business and my hat's off to Leo for doing it. But in a very real sense, when you buy a natural diamond, you're helping an African miner feed his family. When you're buying a lab-grown, 
You're helping Leo DiCaprio get another yacht. That being said, we got to talk turkey. Lab-grown diamonds are a lot cheaper. They can be half the price or less of an equivalent natural diamond. So there's a lot to be said for, hey, listen, why should I spend 10000 on a natural when I can spend 4000 and get a similar lab? Yeah, fair question. And for some people, no brainer, I'll get the one that's cheaper because I, I don't even want to hear the rest. I'm done. If that's you, you should go lab. But my belief is nat natural diamonds are a commodity. There's only so many that exist on planet Earth. And I don't know if you know this, but diamond supply is actually dwindling globally. In fact, the year of peak diamond production worldwide, the year that we got the most diamonds was 2006. Every year less, we're getting fewer and fewer diamonds out of the ground. Every year since 2006, total mining goes down. Why? We're just running out. Um, the Argyle mine in Australia, which was one of the top five largest diamond mines in the world, closed last year permanently. They just said, guys, sorry, we got them all, we're done. Two more out of the top five are scheduled to close next year. And that trend is going to continue. So a diamond, a natural diamond is a commodity because there is limited supply. There's only so much. A lab-grown diamond, in contrast, is a consumer product. There's unlimited supply. Lab-grown companies can manufacture as many of those as they want to, nothing stopping them from doing it. So what that means from your perspective is that commodities retain value, consumer products don't. So if you buy a lab-grown diamond today, you'll, your price tag will be lower, but you've set that money on fire. You should have no expectation that you will ever be able to recover any amount of that money. A natural diamond, on the other hand, not only retains value, but over the long term appreciates. And we have 5,000 years of diamond sales telling us that, right? Uh, in general, natural diamonds will appreciate pretty consistently a little bit faster than inflation. That hasn't been true this year. Values have risen a lot faster than inflation this year because scarcity is starting to be a very real thing. Uh, but you can feel pretty confident that if you buy a natural diamond and you have it for 20 years and you want to sell it, you will get some portion of your money back out. Without knowing what the diamond is or how much you paid for it, I can't tell you if that's going to be 75% or 90% or 100% or 150%, right? People do make profits doing this. But you will get something. A lab-grown, you won't. You just, you just won't. That value is going to virtually zero in the next 10 years. So you have to decide if you care about that. And there's a lot of reasons why you would. I know a lot of people say, listen, I'm buying an engagement ring. Why am I thinking about selling this thing? I'm never going to sell it. I never plan to sell it. Well, nobody who buys an engagement ring plans to sell it the day they buy it. But lots of people do wind up doing that. And there are a lot of reasons for it. Maybe they have a financial hardship. They need the money. Maybe, as much as I hate to say it, maybe things don't work out and they need to, you know, dispose of the ring. Maybe it's a great scenario when they want to upgrade, right? You got that one carat diamond and five years down the road, things are going great for you. You want a two carat diamond. Well, when you buy a natural diamond from us, whatever you pay for it, I'll give you 100% credit to trade in for another diamond anytime. So you paid $10,000 and now you want to go to the 20,000? I will give you the 10,000 in credit. You just pay the difference. I can't do that with a lab-grown diamond because the values decrease. So I can't be buying back a stone that's now worth a tenth as much as you paid. Can't do it. Um, by the way, even if you never sell your natural diamond, one day it'll be part of your estate plan. Crazy to think about for a young person buying a ring that one day their grandchildren will inherit it. But that's the case, right? There's not a lot of things you can buy in this life that will outlive you. But your diamond ring, if you take care of it, will outlive you. Personally, I like the idea that when I put something in my will to my grandkids that it's worth something. I think that matters. Whether you think it matters, of course, is entirely up to you. And to be clear, we do work with both natural and lab-grown diamonds because we're a concierge service and we're here to give you, the public, what you're looking for. So if you're looking for a lab-grown, we can help you with that. And we have excellent sources and beautiful stones and all that good stuff. Just be aware that I, I hate to frame it in these terms because they're not really accurate. I, I, would, I hate to call a diamond an investment because you're not buying it as an investment. But a natural diamond will retain value, a lab-grown diamond Told you that was a long answer to a short question. Um, do you guys have anything to add or did I just talk myself um, to death? I think you got, you got all the facts <coughs> right there. Um, I think that both can make a beautiful ring. Uh, just important that you and your partner 
you know, have a discussion to figure out what is the best option for you, whether that be a natural or be a lab. I think it's an important conversation, but either way, you can totally make a beautiful ring with either stone, um, just up to what makes sense for each couple. And I think just to touch on what Dan was saying, like my own engagement ring is a case study for that. Um, from the time that my now husband purchased my engagement ring years ago um, to now, from the price that he paid for it, wholesalers cannot purchase a stone with those specs at that price today. So I can see the price of diamonds rising pretty rapidly, natural ones at least, rising pretty rapidly throughout, especially this past year, um, due to a handful of reasons, including COVID. There were a lot of things that uh, caused diamond pricing to be affected rather quickly. So if you're the type of person who's thinking about making a diamond purchase um, relatively soon, literally deciding in between months will save you money as well. Things are it rapidly increasing in price. So the price that you pay uh, this month won't be the price that you're gonna be able to pay in January. So just keep that in mind when you're planning an engagement. All right, next question. Uh, Sarah Robison, am I saying? I hope, that, I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right. Uh, what cut do you work most with and what cut is your favorite? I think each of us can talk about this one. Um, so I can tell you as a company, what we work most with is the same thing that the United States works most with, which is the round. The round brilliant is the overwhelmingly most popular shape of diamonds for engagement rings. Um, in fact, 70% of all engagement rings in the United States have a round center stone. So no doubt all of us are gonna say we work with rounds more than anything else. What's my favorite? Well, if you look at my wife's finger, if you look at most jewelers' wife's fingers, it's gonna be a round. Why? Because optically, it's the best. It returns the most light. That's math, right? That's, that's unavoidable. Um, and my wife is on her third engagement ring. She's upgraded twice. So it wasn't always around, but it's around now. And, you know, if in a few years we upgrade again, I don't know if it'll stay around or not. But you should know round is the optically most efficient shape for a diamond. It will return more light than any other shape. Unfortunately, though, carrot for carrot, all else being equal, round is also the most expensive shape. So, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta do your trade offs there. So I love working with rounds. Personally, I also really love ovals. And I have a, a soft spot in my heart for pear shapes and marquees. I just really, really like them. Um, how about you guys? Oof. I don't have my own yet, so they're all still my favorite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I go back and forth all the time. When I first started looking at diamonds, I thought I liked a radiant, but I realized it's just because I like an elongated ratio, which you can achieve that with a bunch of different shapes. Um, hmm. I definitely like the antique stones. I like them because they're just super romantic to me. I like that they're old and they just look a little bit different and no matter when you see one, you can tell it's a diamond, but it kind of catches you off like, huh, what is that? Um, so I really, really do like antiques and by that I mean specifically like an elongated antique cushion. Um, I think anything that's rounded and long. So I'll go for, I love marquees for fashion jewelry. I want to make a little pinky ring for myself. Um, I love elongated shapes, so I'll go for an oval, um, an elongated cushion, of course, which is harder to find. Um, and then rounds. I just think rounds are really, really pretty for any simple pieces. You just get the sparkle. So for studs or for bracelets or for necklaces, I love using rounds a lot too. That's it. I think just kind of what everybody's touching on, and you might notice this trend, is that we tend to draw towards elongated shapes. And there are a handful of reasons for that. But mainly when we're talking about an engagement ring, what I noticed is that with an elongated shape, it just really makes your finger, it just elongates everything it makes everything look beautiful and it also maximizes finger coverage so pulling carrot weight like a stone that's one carrot across all the shapes you'll notice that the, the more elongated ones happen to look bigger even though they weigh the same um, I am super super biased my engagement ring is an oval I love how ovals perform but I will say they have been raining as far as uh, the fancy fancy shape department goes and that has risen the prices on them demand has driven up the price so if you're looking to maximize your your uh, money by getting an elongated shape, I would definitely look into pairs and marquees because they're kind of like the hidden secret, um, and especially with marquees, and they really, really maximize finger coverage as well um, without having to pay that oval premium. Yeah, I'd also mention radiant cuts will do that. If you are, if you're not committed to a rounded shape, an elongated radiant, I think they're undervalued right now. Okay, so that's that question. Uh, next question, 
Do you work with European customers? What are the best tips choosing the shop? Okay, those are two questions. Um, do we work with European customers? Yes, all the time. Uh, customs rules va vary nation by nation, so be in touch with us about your specific situation and we'll see what we can do for you, but yes, we have shipped to close to 50 countries now internationally. Um, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's hard to keep track. Um, and yes, we do work, work with, with folks in Europe all the time. We just sent something to Sweden and we, all, all the time, yes. What are the best tips on choosing the shop? Uh, very briefly, look for somebody reputable. Well, how do you find somebody reputable? Ask people who bought engagement rings or other fine jewelry similar to what you're looking for, for recommendations. Read reviews online. Go and talk to a few people and get a sense. And what, the questions that you should be asking yourself are, one, is this person an expert? Do they know what they're talking about? Because if, you're, if your jeweler doesn't know how to buy the diamonds correctly in the first place, if your jeweler's overpaying, he can't help but overcharge you, right? So make sure you, you work with somebody who you believe is an expert. Then make sure you work with somebody who you believe is being straightforward and candid with you and is sharing his or her best opinion as opposed to trying to serve an agenda, right? One of the reasons why we do things the way we do them, we curate a selection for each client, is when I'm showing a, a client seven or eight or 10 or 12 stones at a time, I genuinely don't have a preference which one they choose. If they're on the table, they've all already met my standards. And now I want the client to choose the one that's best for them. Whereas a, a little jewelry store that owns only a few stones, if at all, they need you to buy their stone because that's what they've got and they don't want to be creating a new payable to, to their vendor. So the, the joke that I always make in the office is, as a parent, I love all my children. I don't really care which one you adopt. I want you to get the one that's right for you. Um, so. Choose somebody who's an expert, choose somebody who's well-reviewed, and choose somebody who you believe is being straightforward with you. Um, you guys have anything to add on that one? Nothing. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dan, you do the best work, we'll visit you. Thanks, please do. Uh, that's an easy one. Um, yes, Marquis work to elongate the finger, Sarah, that's exactly right. Um, all right, Laura asks, can you speak to current trends of engagement rings? As you guys may have noticed, I'm old, I'll let the young people speak to current trends. Please. Ooh, um, so ovals have been the star for probably like what two years at least, if not more. Um, for good reason, they give you that finger coverage that you want. I think pears definitely are coming up. Pears are also great because you get that covered, but they're also thick bottomed, so you get some width too. Um, hmm. Those are the shapes I would think we're winning. Setting wise, I'm noticing a lot more yellow gold. Yeah, I love. I'm a yellow gold girl. I would say it's really, really tight in between yellow and white gold. Um, rose gold is significantly less, but still, like the people who love rose gold, they're rose gold fans, and they will go rose gold. I would say we're we're inching away from the super super thin engagement rings that don't have so much to them. A lot of our clients are vouching for something very custom. They want something intricate. They want something that represents the two of them and doesn't look like everything else in the market. Um, so getting something that really represents the two of you as a couple has been the trend that I've seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with that. One trend that I've seen I think has now run its course. It used to be three years ago that half the rings we made or more had a halo. Not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. Halos are less of a thing than they were. They'll be back eventually, but that... That cycle has ended. Um, okay, can you shed some light on the diamond market? I've heard they aren't as rare and the supply is artificially restricted. I've heard that too. Um, it's not the case. Uh, that used to be the case, again, in the 70s and 80s when De, Beer had De Beers had monopolistic control over the market, right? There was a time, 50, 60, 70 years ago, when De Beers was the absolute dominating force in the rough diamond and diamond mining world where let's say that you're a farmer in South Africa and you're, you know, digging in your, in your, on your property for whatever reason and you discover diamonds. If that had happened, then it's 1940 or 1950. The next day you would get a knock on your door from De Beers saying, congratulations on your diamond find. What we'd like to do is to offer you a very fair price for all of your diamonds that you ever find on your property, but you have to commit to selling all of them to us forever, right? Or you can say no and we will buy out every farm in this neighborhood and crush you, right? That used to be De Beers' attitude. So they controlled all the supply, would stockpile and would artificially restrict. Today, 
those days are over. I don't know if you know this, not only is De Beers not monopolistically in control anymore, they're no longer even the biggest player in diamond mining. They are, so Al Rosa is, is, the, is the largest diamond miner, that's a consortium out of Russia, Russia today, and Rio Tinto and De Beers are fighting for number two, number three status. De Beers just doesn't have that market control anymore. And it started in Russia when, when, they, when uh, large deposits of diamonds were found in Siberia and De Beers came knocking on the door. The Russians basically told them where they could stick it. We're not selling, we're gonna compete. Um, that ended De Beers' dominance. And since then, Australians and Canadians and other players uh, where, where diamonds are found in, in large quantities um, have entered the market. So De Beers' ability to artificially restrict, gone, because now it's a competitive marketplace. Add to that, we've replaced artificial scarcity with actual scarcity. Why? We keep digging diamonds out of the ground and Mother Nature isn't making any more. So as I've mentioned earlier, some of these mines have run out and the rest will sooner or later. At the same time, global economic forces. You know what's one thing we have that we didn't have at all 50 years ago? A middle class in China. That didn't exist, but it does now. China, India, other countries with massive populations that have newfound prosperity due to global advancement and you know their, their uh, rapid ascension as they try to enter kind of first world nation status. Um, suddenly there's a billion Chinese people with a little bit of discretionary money and they want diamonds. Demand has never been as high as it is right now and supply is lower and lower every year. So less supply, more demand, you do the math. There's no artificial scarcity. Um, Anything you guys want to say? All right. No, that was good coverage. Um, all right. Uh, what is the average cost for an engagement diamond? Ooh. Ooh. That's a tough one. That um, changes. That's a moving target, and it, and it depends on where you are and who you are and what's going on. Uh, nationally, in the United States, it's about $8,000. Uh, at least that was the number last year. Um, but that's not particularly meaningful, right? I would, I would encourage you to remember the old saying, comparison is the thief of joy. Don't worry about what other people are spending on an engagement ring. Instead, I would, I would encourage you to use this mental exercise for setting your budget. Um, here's how I advise my clients to do it. Think of a number in your mind that would be too much. That would be a number that makes you uncomfortable. It's more than you want to spend on an engagement ring. Once you have that number, take off 10%. Is it still too much? If it is, take off 10% again. Still too much? The very first time you get to where you go, no, I guess that would be okay. That's your budget. And the reason why is this. An engagement ring is meant to be a considered purchase. It should not be an impulse buy. It shouldn't be something that you just go, okay, here, whatever, here's my card, I don't care, just give it to me. You should have to sweat a little bit buying an engagement ring because it's a symbol of commitment. But it shouldn't be so expensive that it becomes a burden or a source of stress because that's no way to enter into a marriage at all. So pick a number that, hey, any more and I'd be uncomfortable, but at this number, I'm okay. That's your budget. All right, what else have we got? All righty, I think I've answered all the questions. Guys, if you're out there and watching and you have a question I haven't answered, now's your chance. Is there something I'm getting away from behind the camera? What do you got? Yeah, so we got one about the emerald cuts and the best ratio for the fingers that are bigger. Okay, what's the best ratio length to width of an emerald cut for somebody with a bigger finger size? Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Okay, well, I hate to give this answer because it sounds wishy-washy, but the answer is, it depends. Um, it depends on the ring design, right? If you're just looking for a solitaire, then I would probably go for a traditional emerald cut ratio, which is typically in the 1.3 to 1.4, 1.45 kind of a range, because that'll give you some finger coverage while still giving you uh, a little bit of, of meat there to, uh, to you know, work with the larger finger size. Um, I also would recommend against going with a very thin ring, because I think that makes, that makes the, the ring feel out of proportion with a nicely proportioned emerald. But if you're doing, let's say you're doing trapezoids on the sides, now you can go with a more elongated emerald because you're gonna be getting that width from the side stones, right? Let's say you're doing some kind of big chunky pavé. Now maybe you can go with a shorter emerald cut because you've got more stuff going on. So I hate to say it, but it depends. What do you guys think about this one? Um, I totally agree. If it's a solitaire, you need some extra width. So you don't wanna to go too skinny because you also wanna to get the width finger coverage. 
Um, but if it's a three stone or something that's gonna have stuff going on the side, for sure look at like 1.45 and above, something that you're getting that length so it's elongating your finger. Um, you don't want anything too square or rectangular like east-west. I think it really depends on the overall finger. How much real estate are we talking? Because everybody has a difference from their first knuckle all the way up to here. You want to see what do you have left? What are you planning? Are you planning for a really fat, amazing wedding band with big diamonds on it? What it what is your ideal stack and plan to prepare for that? So if you're looking to have a super dainty wedding band and you really want to blow everything out of the water in the engagement ring, you want something that maximizes finger coverage to make sure that, you know, that that finger's looking pretty sparkly. Um, but it really does depend on on ring design and it depends on the individual stone itself. So we kind of have the advantage of having lots of different ring sizes represented in this office. So if you happen to be thinking like, oh, I'm a size four or I'm a size eight, we have everything in between and we can put it on somebody's hand that's similar so you can understand relative proportions and see if you're needing to flank it with side stones or if you want something a little more elongated. Okay, I got another question that just came in. If I'm looking to have a piece by Christmas, when do I need to order it? Um, the easy answer is the sooner the better. Christmas is closer than you think, you guys. Right, we're at the end of October now. We're what, eight, eight or nine weeks to Christmas? Like we're almost there. So it's not too late for Christmas orders. It will be pretty soon. It typically takes us about four weeks to make a custom piece, and we like to have a little bit of margin in there in case something goes wrong in manufacturing, and I want to fix it and make it right. Um, also, don't forget that we have Thanksgiving in between now and Christmas, which. You know, for the better part of a week, a lot of people aren't working. Um, so if your order's not in before Thanksgiving, it becomes harder and harder for us to deliver by Christmas. And a week or two sooner will take a lot of stress off of both us and you. Mm -hmm. I would rather have that piece sitting in your sock drawer for an extra couple of weeks than have us scrambling and now it's the December 20th and we can barely make it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's better for you to order sooner our craftsmen are less busy now than they will be in December, so they can spend more time on each job, which helps. Prices are continuing to rise, so you might save a couple percent now versus December. So for lots of reasons, the sooner the better, um, it's, to, it's to your benefit. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, you wanna say something? Yes, I would say that like what people don't really think about is now is engagement season. So 60% of couples are getting engaged in this holiday season. You guys are traveling. You have time off of work. You're spending time with family. This is the time where people make those commitments. So you really want to make sure that you are not pushing yourself all the way up until the edge. I would say if you're looking for something over Christmas, depending on where you're located, because keep in mind, shipping starts getting affected once there's snow in the East Coast and other places. International shipping takes extra time. But really, what you want to think about is I need my order in as soon as possible. But I would say mid-November is really where you want to you, you want to put the pedal to the metal. Mm. I think we've answered everything. I'm going to give you guys one more minute just in case something else comes in. And uh, it's been an hour. I don't want to keep you guys here all day. So if nothing else comes in, we'll sign off shortly. Um, Speaking on behalf of myself and on behalf of my team, thanks for spending this hour with us. I hope you found it useful and interesting. Uh, it's been fun for me. I always love seeing what are the questions that people have out there. Uh, we're here all the time. Um, for those of you who don't know how to contact us, obviously you found us on Instagram. You can always reach out to us there. Uh, you can email us at info at conciergediamonds.com. The website is www.conciergediamonds.com. Uh, call us, 213-261-4330. We're located in downtown LA. We see clients here locally by appointment, so if, you're, if you want to come in, please do call and set something up because for COVID reasons and for security reasons, we can't just accept walk-ins. Um, so yeah, we're easy to get. Oh, you can find me on Reddit where I go by Diamond Dealer. Um, I'm guessing some of you probably already know that. Um, we're pretty easy to get around here and we love talking to people, so, so reach out, be in touch. Even if there's nothing you need right now and you just have a question, don't worry, we're not here to latch on to you and try to shake you until money falls out of your pockets. We're, we're here to help. Um, all right, well, if there's nothing else... Oh, yes, to answer that to that, that question. Yes, Caroline's in a Squid Game costume for Halloween. She did it. <laughs> My mask didn't um, come, okay? I had to draw off the handle of something from the Dollar Tree, but I did it. I'm also, uh, you know, in the management here, so I thought the square would be appropriate. So, Incredible. yeah. 
the rest of us missed that memo or we could have all done that, but we didn't. <laughs> um, all right, you guys, at this point, I thank you all for spending the time. I hope to hear from you soon. Um, again, my name's Dan Moran. That's Caroline. That's Kendall. And uh, on behalf of the whole team, thanks very much. Have a great weekend. Bye, guys. Wow. That felt <coughs> I told you.